And it's now time for our AAAS President's Address. And it's my great pleasure to be able to introduce our AAAS President, Stephen Chu. Steve Chu is the William R. Kennan Jr. Professor of Physics and Professor of Molecular and Cellular Physiology at Stanford University. Dr. Chu is a very distinguished scientist who's held numerous significant positions and can claim a host of impressive accomplishments. He's published over 280 papers in atomic and polymer physics, biophysics, biology, bioimaging, batteries, and other energy technologies. He holds 15 patents and an additional nine patent disclosures or filings since 2015. Notably, from 2009 to 2013, Dr. Chu was the 12th U.S. Secretary of Energy. As the first scientist to hold this cabinet position and the longest serving energy secretary, Dr. Chu recruited outstanding scientists and engineers to the Department of Energy, and he began several important initiatives, including ARPA-E, the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Energy, the Energy Innovation Hubs, and was personally tasked by President Obama to assist in stopping the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Prior to his appointment as Secretary of Energy, Dr. Chu was the director of the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, where he was active in pursuit of alternative and renewable energy technologies. And a member of the Stanford faculty since 1987, Dr. Chu helped launch BioX, a multidisciplinary institute combining the physical and biological sciences with medicine and engineering. And previously, Dr. Chu was head of the quantum electronics research development department at AT&T Bell Labs. Dr. Chu, of course, is the co-recipient of the 1997 Nobel Prize in Physics for his contributions to laser cooling and atom trapping, and he's received numerous other awards, and I will spare you the list tonight. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And he's a foreign member of the Royal Society, the Royal Academy of Engineering, the Chinese Academy of Sciences, the Korean Academy of Sciences and Technology, and the National Academies of Sciences in Belarus. Dr. Chu completed his undergraduate degree in mathematics and physics at the University of Rochester and holds a PhD in physics from the University of California, Berkeley. He also holds 32 honorary degrees. I don't know if that's a record, but I was impressed. Uh, he became a member of AAAS back in 1995 and was elected as a fellow of AAAS in 2000. At the end of this meeting, Steve will assume the role of chair of the AAAS Board of Directors. And it is my great pleasure now to welcome you, Dr. Chu, to the stage. All right, thank you very much, Peggy. Um, I just want to tell the staffers of the AAAS, it's uh, five minutes to six. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about envisioning tomorrow and, um, and how we're advancing science. And rising involves some, several gathering storms. I am not going to talk about the exciting program uh, that's there before you, and, um, and I hope you enjoy it. But I will uh, quote the greatest American philosopher of the 20th century to lead this off. Just in case you're wondering who that is, it's Yogi Berra, who on the right-hand side is seen in a philosophical conversation. <laughs> and he said many, many wise things, but it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future, is um, very telling for this theme. I, what, what is rising above the Ganymede Storm? I'm going to get a little bit more into this, but just to remind you, I was privileged to serve on this committee that wrote the report chaired by Norm Augustine and um, uh, also a revisiting of the Gathering Storm. But let me go, just move on quickly to the AAAS. And I want to give very personal visions of how I think we can improve things. So this, I am not speaking as the president of the AAAS. I am not speaking for the board. I am not speaking for the staff. It's just me. Um, 
And I want to talk a little bit about science policy. I want to talk about science communication, uh, dissemination of science to a larger audience, and reaching a growing membership. In fact, uh, my ambitions are large. Uh, I would love to grow the membership by about tenfold. Why tenfold? Because physicists think in orders of magnitude. <laughs> and so um, one of the things we are very proud of at the AAAS is that we uh, coordinate the Science and Technology Policy Fellowship Program. And this is where we link scientists. Typically, they're young PGs, graduate students who just gotten their degrees and, and want to actually learn more about the federal government, but also use their expertise to give advice to the federal government. Most of the science fellows are supported by federal agencies, but there are 35 or so uh, fellows, maybe 38, that are supported that go to Congress because the congressional offices typically cannot afford to pay even a postdoctoral salary. And so the AAAS supports two of these congressional fellows. And I would love to see, and I'm working towards raising contributions to now endow six fellows, because we pay for these fellows out of our operating budget. OK, another thing that I would like to talk about is science communication. AAAS runs Sciline. You may not know about it, but I'm going to introduce you to it. Well, I'm not going to. Uh, and this is the thing in their website. Your story involves science. You need an expert. You need that expert now. And so I'm going to introduce you to Rick Weiss, the director. Welcome, of everyone, Sci to this Sideline Media Briefing on the Future of Food, a particularly fun media briefing today featuring uh, three experts uh, looking at different aspects of what we might be eating in the years to come, and for some of us already. Uh, before we get started, I just want to take one minute to introduce Sideline to those of you who may not be familiar with us. We are a philanthropically funded free service for reporters with one overarching mission, which is to help you get more research-based evidence into your news stories. Okay, so that's Sideline, and uh, it, it's one of the things I'm very proud of, the AAAS and, and the board uh, are very proud of. Another thing we do is in the front section of Science Magazine, we publish daily, weekly and daily uh, uh, things. And this is from a weekly thing where you can click on it, you'll get this picture, and this is, uh, you can get news stories like uh, uh, Mission Impossible, how does the uh, World Health Organization director fight to prevent a pandemic without offending China, and how it's going about. Uh, just, I want to pause a little bit briefly, take a little detour, and just remind you uh, the coronavirus is worrisome, but it, the mother of all viruses was the Spanish influenza pandemic of 2018-2019. It was named the Spanish flu by the French, who had more political control. <laughs> and it originated in France. And uh, it infected about 27% of the entire world population and the estimate it has killed 3 to 6% of the entire world population. The 2009 H1N1 virus, it's related to the Spanish flu, originated in Mexico and the United States, and it's estimated by the CDC to have killed between 150 and nearly 600,000 people. Okay? <laughs> uh, so what has happened? Well, the internet has happened. <laughs> And so you, one has to keep this in mind. And then there's another fear that the experts are, are worried about. There's an Asian avian flu. It's called H5N1. Uh, there is a new outbreak uh, in the last couple of days in China. It's transmitted among birds. Very weak transmission to people. But if a person gets it, they have a 60% chance of dying. So we have other problems. Let me go to some cheerful news uh, about science communication. Uh, science can be fun. And if you look at this cat, this is in the, some of the newsletters that uh, we have. And this is a quote from this. Now a new study shows that cats do, in fact, have facial expressions. Humans just aren't that good at interpreting them. And so 6,000 people were asked whether each cat expression is positive or negative. And it's pretty good. 59% said they correctly identified. 
But if you're a veterinarian or someone who works a lot with animals, you get more than 75% correct, with leading researchers to dub them cat whisperers. Now, this is just fun. And uh, if we can bring this sort of fun of science to more of a general public, it would be great. Now, I want to go on and say that we have a membership. Uh, the membership is, um, this is a record of our membership over the past three years. Uh, paid membership is about 100, a little less than 100,000, and the upper curve is all members. Okay, the trouble with paid membership and the trouble with many scientists, young scientists, including graduate students and postdocs that I train today, uh, say, well, I don't want to join AAAS and get Science Magazine. I get it free. And I hope to be a faculty member. I will still get it free. And so I think we need a new business model. This is actively being considered and pursued among the staff. And I just want to do a little advertisement of something I've been saying over the last several board meetings. And what about a Spotify membership model? So my apologies to AAAS. I hope you don't get sued by Spotify. Um, and so maybe for $3 a month to support all the noble missions of the AAAS. I remind you that the American Civil Liberties Union has over a million members, more than about 10 times our membership, that pay at least $35 per year. Um, what do you get? Well, you support the noble mission, you receive a electronic copy of the front end section of science, and I would like to see if we could develop, at very low cost, another front end section that addresses the science can be fun, not only for professional scientists, uh, people who have a real interest in science, but for a more lay audience, including K through 12 people. And so this communication is in my dream of what I want. Um, unfortunately, you know, you're, as an officer of the AAAS, I'm only here for a very short time. This will take a long time, so I hope uh, the, my successors and uh, the able staff of the AAAS can do this. Um, all right, more about envisioning the future. And so my vision of the future is really shaped by history. And so just to remind you of a very famous saying uh, from a Spanish-American philosopher, those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Another version of this is a Gan Wilson cartoon which says, you will make the same foolish mistakes you have made before, but not only once, but many, many times. All right, so let me turn the clock back 120 years or more. Uh, and it was the opening inaugural address of Sir William Crookes. Uh, and it was his uh, address of the president of the British Association for the Advancement of Science. Um, now, I do not want the AAAS stand up like the British Association for the Advancement of Science, because many of you, most of you, have never even heard of this. Um, anyway. He began his address by saying, England and all civilized countries are in deadly peril. It is the chemist who must come to the rescue. Before we're in the actual grip of actual dirt, the chemist will step in and postpone the day of famine. With that address, he set off an international race to see if you can prevent starvation. What was the issue? The issue was we were, uh, Natural fertilizer wasn't enough. We were actually getting fertilizer from South America. Uh, guano, that's a technical word for bird doo-doo. Uh, that made very, but they're gonna run out of this nitrogen-based fertilizer. And so the prediction was in a couple of decades, Europe begins to starve. So that international waste was won first and awarded a Nobel Prize to Fritz Haber in 1918. In 1931, Bosch, who worked with Haber to actually use high pressure uh, uh, chemistry to actually make it work practically, got another Nobel Prize for the same work. Uh, and then many years later, Gerhard Erl got a Nobel Prize for his work on heterogeneous catalysis, where it says in the Nobel Prize statement that at last we're beginning to understand the Haber-Bosch process. So two and a half Nobel Prizes. Why? Because it enabled the world to feed itself. All right. Science has done other things. Another really, truly great Nobel Prize in peace was awarded to Norman Borlaug, who bred different strains of wheat to develop 
uh, disease-resistant dwarf strain of wheat that had the thick stalks and shorter so they can have the heavier kernels. And in this picture, you have the dwarf strains of wheat with the normal wheat. And from this work and the work of fertilizers, you look from 1960, where the population was 3 billion people, to 2005, where the population was 6.5 billion people, the blue and red curves are the production of grains, wheat, rice, corn, around the world, not in the United States, around the world. The black and, uh, dots are the amount of land put under agricultural cultivation. It remained the same. It actually went down. Okay, so science rose to the challenge. So the question is, will science meet the challenges that we face today? Climate change is the 800 pound, 8,000 pound gorilla in the room. But there are other challenges like internet, which spreads misinformation very rapidly uh, as a threat to democracy. So let me talk a little bit about climate change. Are the glaciers melting? Is the sea level rising? The short answer is yes. But let's go back and look at history. I'm not going to look at climate models. And so if you go back and look in history, on the right-hand side is the present time. And as you go leftward, you're actually going back in time. And that red line is where we are today in temperature. Oh, sorry. The red line is one and a half degrees to two degrees. I'm being generous, warmer than we are in temperature. And you ask in that last warm period, roughly 125,000 years ago, where was the sea level? It was six to nine meters higher. So that's not, that's not a climate prediction. That's history. We know it's history because we know where the sea levels were because of the fossil records of critters that lived between land and ocean all around the world. And so now we thought this would take several thousand years. But with recent uh, measurements in Antarctica and Greenland and other places, um, many people are now afraid this, most of this rise will occur in less than 250 years. So that's just the beginning. Water aquifers are being depleted in many parts of the world. We see increased droughts, heat waves, forest fires, water shortages, crop failures. And all those things could, in the near-term future, create climate refugees. So if you think of refugees going into Europe, five million or so, think of what would tens of millions to hundreds of millions of people would do. And these are where the water stress shortages are. When I was Secretary of Energy, I talked with the Indian ministers, and they were panic struck that if the rise, sea level rises in Bangladesh, many, many very poor people won't go inland and up in the mountains. They will go across the border. And one of the ministers asked me, what are we going to do? Do we shoot them at the border? OK, so now, this is an IPC set of scenarios of emissions um, on the vertical axis and time uh, on the horizontal axis. Many, many scenarios. So I'm going to do my own scenario. Uh, here's my scenario. I just drew it uh, because I think this is more likely because the emission scenarios to keep us to one and a half, maybe two degrees, require negative world total emissions on all greenhouse gas by 2080. Let me say it again. It requires negative emissions by 2080. But this was actually made a year or two ago, and we're getting so we're in order to keep that, we actually have to have more aggressive negative emissions. A very iconic picture that I talked about uh, for many years, uh, even before our Secretary of Energy, is uh, Earthrise. And it's Apollo 8 that uh, orbited the moon. And the last orbit, they turned the capsule Earthworm and took this picture. And the astronaut who took the picture said, we came all this way to explore the moon. And the most important thing is we've discovered the Earth. Look at this picture. The moon is not a good place to live. No water, no air, no magnetic field, so you get lethal dose of radiation. Earth looks pretty good from this vantage point. Everywhere around, black. OK, let's talk about it. One of the great discoveries over the last couple of decades was that there are many, many exoplanets, planets outside of our own solar system, estimated uh, to be maybe 10 billion Earth-like planets within the reach of our own galaxy. 
So this is uh, on the left-hand side a picture of a potential Earth-like planet, meaning that the temperature allows liquid water. Uh, and that's a picture of, uh, we think, our Milky Way from afar. Uh, the photographer who took that picture had a very wide-angle lens. <laughs> Anyway, this is the radius of, of the Milky Way. We are here over there. And you can do a little calculation. The time to travel one-fifth the radius of the galaxy, which is, gives you a reasonable probability of finding a good planet, will take 45 million years based on a very optimistic orbiting planet boosting that I made, where as the satellite goes around, let's say Mars, it goes in and gets a little boost up, and it goes around Jupiter, it gets another boost up, and Venus, and all this other stuff. You don't get to these high velocities with chemical fuel. You use the planet. You slow down the planets a little bit, but you get the boost. Then you're traveling over uh, 70,000 kilometers per second on your way, and it takes you 45 million years to get there. And when you get there, there's no way to slow yourself up and land safely. <laughs> OK? Forget about trashing this planet and moving on to a new world. <laughs> we are here. <laughs> All right. Now, the UN goal to keep the temperature below at 1.5 degrees requires we stay below 2,900 gigatons of carbon. This is where that danger line is. I just want to say that we on the y-axis is total cumulative emissions. Why cumulative emissions? Because once you put the carbon dioxide up, half of it get, gets very rapidly absorbed by land and ocean, and the rest of it just circulates land, ocean, and back up again. And the lifetime of the remaining half is estimated to be about 10,000 years. So don't think 2100. Think 2112100, another decimal point. Most of the greenhouse gas emissions have occurred since 1950. Yogi Berra did not say that, but he could have. Uh, if you don't change direction, you might end up where you're heading. All right. I'm going to give you a little good news. Uh, technology is happening. The cost of EV batteries has declined tenfold from 2010 to 2020. Uh, if you take where we are in batteries today, and that little dot is the 18650-style battery that Tesla uses for their S1. Uh, the hope is that we can get up to that green circle there. It's not a hope. Uh, I'm on the board of a battery company. I do battery research. And the battery company is now shipping samples uh, with energy densities around double the energy density of current batteries, uh, both in weight and in um, volume. All right, so EVs are projected to increase in sales from where we are today to perhaps by uh, something like uh, even very early, uh, they're projected to be rising in sales. By 2040, it's been projected that perhaps 55% of light duty vehicles uh, would be EVs. Is there enough lithium? And the answer is, turns out there is. We're about to publish a paper uh, that says you can get lithium from seawater in a very practical manner. If you do that, you've just increased the lithium reservoirs about 10,000-fold. Now, solar will continue to go down dramatically, at least another factor of two. And if you go to Africa, uh, and you will see pictures like this, when you walk around and you see people carrying things on their heads. You pe see people carrying water walking kilometers uh, by themselves. You see people pushing bicycles loaded with 100 kilograms of potatoes by themselves. Many of these people are so poor they can't even afford animals to do this. And what would imagine what would happen if you can bring very cheap solar energy to this population. However, it has to be really cheap and reliable. And, and with solar energy, you can have irrigation and water purification, where many countries, especially in East Africa, don't even have that, let alone uh, transportation. And, but the introduction of very inexpensive but reliable electric two- and three-wheelers is possible. Uh, but for now, we need a new business model in the little capex really drops down by another fivefold. All right. But this is a possibility, and so maybe you can do this and bootstrap past petroleum-based uh, transportation. 
just as cell phones did. Another very real possibility is that clean electricity can be less than one and a half cents per kilowatt hour, and it will be, it's already two cents a kilowatt hour in the best solar sites in the Middle East. This is not just my dream. It is the firm prediction of oil companies. I'm an advisor to Royal Dutch Shell, and they are convinced by 2030, 2040, at the latest, renewable energy will be one and a half cents a kilowatt hour and the petroleum will peak around that time, petroleum use for transportation. And so this really opens up very exciting possibilities if the electricity is so cheap that you can use electrochemistry to make carbon-free hydrogen and other forms of clean energy. Let me move very quickly to agriculture. It turns out that more greenhouse gas emissions come from agriculture, land use, forestry, than from all of electricity generation around the world. And so I marked out in the orange and the blue methane, more than half the methane emissions in the world are due to agriculture and animal raising. Most of the N2O is due to fertilizer runoff. And so all this stuff is agriculture. And right now, uh, because of the progress, we actually, more than half of the habitable land around the world is used today for agriculture and grazing. So this is already geoengineering on a grand scale. We've engineered everything we eat. Here's a quiz, I'm a professor. That's some corn, that's another picture of corn. That's another picture of corn. Can you pick out the native corn? It's unrecognizable. And so that has been bred. This is another picture. This is pictures of beef cattle, pigs, and broiler chickens. The full circumference of the circle denotes their natural lifetime. And the red part is when these animals are slaughtered from birth. They've been bred to grow very rapidly. American pigs uh, are slaughtered in roughly 24 weeks from birth, and they weigh 280 pounds. Uh, so the livestock have been really optimized for very rapid growth, and many uh, species some of the birds well, actually can't go to maturity because they're so disproportionately weighted they can't stand up. Now, another thing about geoengineering. Uh, if you think of all the mammal mass in the world, and on one side you put in wild animals, mice, rats, wild deer, buffalo, tigers and tigers and bears, and the other side you put people and the animals we eat, it turns out that 96% of the mammal mass are us. 96% are us. We have truly engineered the world. We've engineered the animals. These are domestic turkeys, three and a half months of slaughter. Uh, they are so breast heavy, they can't mate. So they're made by, uh, mated through artificial insemination. All right? And we don't, so that's three and a half month old turkeys. They look very different than wild turkeys of unknown ages. I can only tell you how old this wild turkey is. <laughs> 101 is eight years old. Okay, think of the emissions. Uh, China and the United States lead the world in emissions. Ch both China and the United China's double the United States now, but uh, the United States is more than the EU 28. If you look at just beef and dairy cattle, if they were a country, the greenhouse gases from beef and dairy cattle would be more greenhouse gas emissions than the entire EU 28. I should say EU 27 plus Great Britain, all right? <laughs> this is a significant part of greenhouse gas emissions. And the good news is that there are developing very rapidly vegetable-based meat things that could uh, ha hopefully gain traction uh, and personal favor among the tastes. Younger people are gravitating towards that very rapidly. Um, there is other good news that's happening. Uh, there's a startup company called Pivot Bio that's already started not only field testing, but it's now commercially been made available to some selected farmers where corn and the microbes on the seeds of the corn have been such that if, when you plant the corn, the microbes 
um, interact with the corn and make the corn fertilizer, nitrogen-based fertilizer. And so the picture on the right is nitrogen-based fertilizer from corn, which greatly reduces the need for energy to make ammonia to make fertilizer, but also greatly re reduces the N2O runoff, also a big problem with algae blooms as well as greenhouse gases. But if you really want a sustainable world, the world population cannot increase forever. This is not rocket science. And however, economic, increased economic prosperity and global competitiveness in all countries is based on having more young people, more young workers support a smaller, older population. All right? This is known as a Ponzi scheme or pyramid scheme to cut through all the other stuff. Now, uh, it was noted by our sponsor, uh, there's a new Hans Rosling Center, and uh, so I'm gonna show you some data there. If you don't know this website called Gapminder, you should explore it. It's fantastic. And so using that, I plotted on the y-axis uh, fertility rate, and on the x-axis uh, income, uh, average income of each country. You can pick any country you want. So I happen to pick India, Mexico, and the United States. And the dashed line is what you need for flat population, no growth, no shrinkage. And you see the United States is below that. You see that Mexico has gone, Germany, sorry, has gone below that. Mexico has gone below that. India, which is not a rich country, Mean, mean average income in US dollars is less than $8,000 a year. It is now at 2.2 to 2.3 fertility rate. So you don't even have to be rich to have, stop having babies. Why that is, is uh, something of great debate. I can offer you know, uh, women's education, uh, lighting at night, something else to do at night, uh, and like late night TV and other things. But that, that's just theory. Uh, the fact is <laughs> that uh, it's working. Uh, even in Africa, it's beginning to work, except in East Africa, where the fertility rate is still five, six, and seven uh, per woman. But the hope is very, very quickly, as you bring them out of poverty, this goes down very rapidly, because you don't want to pay for that many of your kids' college educations. Anyway. All right, we need a strategy how to increase prosperity in developing and developed countries with declining populations. And we need a different measure of wealth. Because as long as the measure of wealth is GDP, that means you're driven to increase production and consumption of stuff. One car per family is not good enough. Two cars per family is good. Two car, one car per adult. One uh, vehicle is the average in American adults, if you have a number of vehicles in America, including delivery trucks, taxis, and adults, it's one to one in the US. All right? Do we want it to be two to one? Do we want China to be one to one, which is one in 20? And the answer is no. We have to redefine what we mean by wealth. And so think of what you treasure. Uh, it should be quality of health, including your health in old age. It should be education, including continued and renewal education, lowering of stress levels, connections in family and friends. So we need to get onto these metrics before, otherwise we're gonna be chasing, making, and consuming more stuff. On my remaining hour, I'm gonna <laughs> talk about a few things. I'm gonna talk about immigrants and how they've added immensely to our scientific and technological excellence, and I'm gonna report on a few other things. So let me talk about immigrants. The United States is a country of immigrants. And the brain gains we've had in science was stimulated by political events that were gifts to American science. And think of Germany and Italy in the 1930s and early 1940s. Think of China as the Communist Revolution was taking over. Um, my parents came to the United States during World War II uh, to go to graduate school at MIT. Uh, after the communists took over, they couldn't go back, they would be killed. My mother's father was a president of a major university. He had to exit for his life with nothing besides his life because he too would have been killed. My, that's my mother's father. My father's father 
uh, was going to be killed, but they didn't get to the Shanghai area in time. He died of natural causes, so they did the only logical thing. They killed the oldest male child at the time in the family, who happened to be 21. So there are these gifts. Uh, the Cultural Revolution, Tiananmen Square, the Soviet Union allowed Jewish immigration. And also, in the last more than half century, graduate students and postdocs in foreign countries came to study in the United States and stayed because we're a free, open, and accepting society. And these students became US citizens, raised their families here, as my parents did. They, I don't speak Chinese. They, at the time, they said, we, you're going to grow up confused. We only want you to hear English. So they only spoke to us in English as I, we were growing up. All right. So let me remind you of immigrant contributions to American science. 143 immigrants in the United States have won Nobel Prizes. That's 3%, 3-4% of all laureates. That's if you count the first generation, but I'm second generation. If you count the second generation, it's harder to count. It's probably over 50%. All physics Nobel Prizes uh, of laureates born in China came into the United States, got their PhDs, and got Nobel Prizes in the United States. There's something magical about the education system in the United States. If you look between, what is this, 2007 and 2019, the green are foreign laureates, Nobel laureates all around the world, except the United States. The yellow are native-born US laureates, and the green or whatever color that is, the light green, is foreign-born US laureates. This is staggering. My wife is Welsh, uh, and she was particularly irritated in 2016 that five of the no nine Nobel laureates in the United States and one sort of Nobel Prize in economic science uh, were British-born and British educated with PhDs in Great Britain, but they started their careers in the US because of better opportunities. Okay, immigrants played an essential role in our national defense. Uh, if you look at the immigrants who worked in the Manhattan Project, it's a kind of an, um, an all-star list of um, many, most of them, many of them Nobel laureates, uh, and the ones in red, Enrico Fermi, James Frank, Leo Szilard, Eugene Wigner, uh, happened to be working in one University of Chicago metallurgical lab, all right? If you look at immigrant uh, contributions in business, of the 44 of the top 100 Fortune, so-called Fortune 500 companies, 45% uh, were founded by immigrants or children. Includes Intel, Andy Grove, it includes Google, Sergey Brin, includes Amazon, Jeff Bezos, second generation Cuban, Tesla, Elon Musk, first generation South African, Yahoo, NVIDIA, and so on. So the contributions were enormous. And um, I now town turn to a recent report. Uh, it was commissioned by the National Science Foundation. Uh, it was on fundamental research security. It's a Jason report that came out December of 2019. And in the early part of the report, it reminds us that as of 2017, foreign students represented 35% of graduate students throughout the sciences, health, and engineering fields. In the physical sciences, over 30% of the masters and over 40% of the PhD students are foreign. Also noting that China alone count, accounts for 34% of this total. So, while we're going to safeguard, I'll talk more about this, safeguard against attempts by the China and other countries to gain early and inappropriate access to what U.S. researchers are doing in fundamental research, the U.S. should reaffirm the principles uh, of the presidential directive. This is a little out of order, um, but I'm just saying that restricting international scientific collaborations with China and the non-approval student visas of Chinese PhD students Anecdotal evidence of two universities I sampled, Stanford and Berkeley, suggests about 10% of the engineering students from China were not approved, and so they were frozen out of the class of 2019, 2020. They couldn't come to the United States, they're in China. And so this is having a polling effect on applications today. Um, now, a finding of the Jason report talked about so-called national security decision directive 189. 
NSDD 189. It was, re it was stated in 1985. It was reaffirmed in 2001 and 2010. And it defines fundamental research. Fundamental research means basic and applied research in science and engineering, the results of which are ordinarily published and shared broadly within the scientific community as distinguished from proprietary research and from industrial development, design, production, and product utilization, the results of which are arbitrarily are ordinarily restricted for proprietary or national security reasons. This directive goes on to say, it is a policy, and I put in, though it was the Reagan administration, uh, that to the maximum extent possible, the products of fundamental research remain unrestricted. It is also the policy of this administration that where the national security requires control, the mechanism for control of information generated during federally funded fundamental research in science, technology, and engineering at colleges, universities, and laboratories is classification. No restrictions may be placed upon the conduct for re or reporting of federally funded fundamental research. Okay. This directive is now being debated. We pull it back, just so you know. This is a directive that came out of the Reagan administration, reaffirmed by two other presidential administrations. So it's of concern. I point you to other documents to get uh, different points of view than the Jason report, very much hawk or hawkish points of view. There's an IP commission. I know about a third of the people on this commission. They're good people, but they're raising concerns. There is a Senate report, threats to US talent enterprise, China's talent recruitment plans. There's an FBI report that talks about the China Talents Program, where it says a large number of foreign students, researchers, scientists, and professionals in the United States, combined with current technological capabilities, allows foreign governments to contact and recruit individuals with the hopes of acquire, to acquire advanced technology without research costs. It goes on to say, well, look. Well, look what China is doing. Um, and they look pointed to one of the five-year plans, 2011 to 2015. Uh, the report was uh, issued just after that. And they listed topics. They're going to want to develop technology, new energy, nuclear, wind, solar power, energy conservation, environmental protection, energy reduction targets, biotechnology, drugs and medical devices, new materials, rare and high-end semiconductors, new information technologies, high-end manufacturing equipment, clean energy vehicles. Okay, so what are our science agencies doing under pressure from Congress? And so Paul Dabar, who's the Under Secretary of Science, was quoted in an article of Science Magazine as saying, we are not saying that universities can't take money from these countries. That's their decision. But if you're working for the DOE and taking taxpayer dollars, we don't want you to work for them at the same time. Employees at the DOE's 17 national laboratories would be given the choice of either severing their foreign ties or leaving their job, he says. Academic researchers who maintain their foreign collaborations would no longer be able to compete with DOE grants. Many of my friends are at Slack and Berkeley Labs say if they're doing ultra-fast basic research, they simply cannot travel to China uh, with any DOE label, period, just to go to a conference. Um, the NIH has said uh, that it requires that PIs must declare all significant foreign support, which is totally fair. Uh, direct financial support, support of graduate students, completely justified. But in a frequently asked questions section, they state that significant support should include materials or reagents not available commercially. That act policy actually conflicts with the policy of Science magazine which says, after publication in the fine print, all reasonable requests for data, code, or materials must be fulfilled. If a researcher says, can I have your plasmid? You have to give it to them. Uh, and now the NIH is now requiring that if a PI wants to collaborate with any foreign scientist, whether it be China or Germany, or will actually take data with their collaborator friend in this foreign country, uh, for example, a cryo-EM setup in Germany, uh, you need prior approval. And, and they're actually rejecting approvals, and they have to be appealed, including actually collaborations from Germany. 
OK. Now, the China's 12 five-year plan is amazingly remarkable resemblance to the goals I was doing with Bob, Secretary of Energy. And so I'm going to take you back to a talk I gave at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. at the end of November 2010. And the title of the talk was, Is the Energy Race Our New Sputnik Moment? And so it begins by saying, look, in October 1957, the Soviet Union placed a 184-pound satellite into orbit. And it showed a picture of the New York Times headline. And I talked about President Eisenhower's speech that came about a month later. And he did not respond by calling for increased military spending. Instead, he said the following. According to my scientific friends, one of our greatest and most glaring deficiencies is the failure of us in this country to give high priority enough to, to give high priority enough to scientific education and to the place of science in our national life. One great failure danger that no amount of money or response resources currently devoted can fully meet is education. Education requires time, incentive, and skilled teachers. They believe the second critical need is of, of giving higher priority, both public and private, to basic research. Amazing response from one of the two five-star generals in the history of the United States. And I was nine years old at the time, and I was part of many, many post-Sputnik science programs in high school, college, and beyond. And that trained a huge new core of American scientists. All right. In, this is my talk in 2010. Innovation adds to the wealth of society. Innovation and technology are, near, are at the heart of innovation, and leadership in innovation cannot be taken for granted. I gave some examples. Model T Ford, first transistor, integrated circuits, the first airplane, satellite communication, GPS, the internet, and internet search engines like Google. But let me remind you that Henry Ford did not invent the internal combustion engine. He did not invent the assembly line. He improved upon those things and made it low-cost manufacturing. Sound a little familiar? OK. <laughs> um, I went on to say, for over a century, America has led the world in innovation. Today, technology is at risk. I gave some examples. In 2009, 51% of US patents were awarded to non-US companies. China has gone from 15th place to fifth place. This is quoting Rising Above the Gathering Storm. The World Economic Forum ranks the US 48th in quality of mathematics and science education. China's Tsinghua and Peking universities are the two largest suppliers of students who receive PhDs in the United States. Then I quoted the then premier of China, Wen Jiabao, and said, we should use scientific and technological innovation as an important pillar and to develop new industries of strategic importance. Science and technology is a powerful engine of economic growth. We will accelerate the development of low carbon economy and the green economy so as to gain an advantageous position in the international industrial competition. I went on to say we face a choice today. Will we maintain America's innovation leadership or will we fall behind? And that we had to seize this innovation opportunity and we can't afford not to. I talked about new initiatives like RPE uh, and energy innovation hubs. But I also said that there's a difference between the Cold War and the Sputnik Challenge and all these other things. Because while you're competing for leadership and innovation, we have much to gain with cooperating with China, India, and other countries. And that in the next two decades, in 2010, I said China will build new buildings to house 350 American people, more than one US population, and they're building another for another 300 million people, another US population. And in 80% of uh, India uh, infrastructure does not exist today. And these countries will provide us with markets and laboratories for innovation. Let me fast forward to today. Here's a postscript. What China wants in their five-year plan, as warned by the FBI, sounds chillingly like what we wanted when I was Secretary of Energy. And then two weeks after I gave the speech, 
Obama actually uh, talked about it, uh, the Sputnik moment in his State of the Union address. I went back and looked at data of comparing Chinese EU 28 US support and R&D, and I looked up the last three points of data so I can uh, project them because you have to look at those separately, and we see that China has now pulled ahead of the United States. So what is the proper response? The US should respond by increasing investments, in science, technology, and STEM education, not by erecting walls to international collaborations. <clears throat> I'm going to return to Eisenhower's speech um, because there's something he said that was amazing. Although tonight's purpose, I stress the influence of science on defense, the peaceful contributions of science to healing, to enriching life, to freeing the spirit, these are the most important products of the conquest of nature's secrets. We shall never cease to hope and work for the coming of the day when the scientists can give his and her full attention, not to human destruction, but to human happiness and fulfillment. <clears throat> uh, that was pretty good stuff. I want to also quote uh, from my uh, current postdoc, uh, Cornell, a high energy physicist, and she emigrated to the United States in 2009, got her PhD at the University of Chicago in uh, physics, and now is Cornell Postal, and she wrote a column in 2019. And she asked the question, what is the role of scientists in the affairs of state? And she goes on to say that her mother, who wasn't thrilled with her going into science in the first place, uh, but it, it speaks of her conflicted decision to be part of the March on Science in April 17. There are people within the AAAS staff and outside who are also conflicted. Is this part of the AAAS? Are we becoming political demonstrators? And so she struggled with this. Um, and, and she quoted her mother, focus on your profession, my mother warned. Don't talk about politics. Don't participate in politics. Don't ever join street demonstrations. My mother told me that too. I never have joined a street demonstration. <laughs> uh, so anyway, but the point here is that creativity and science flourish best in an open environment. Why? Because democracy cherishes free speech, the open flow of information, and the ability to openly question political leaders. And in science, observation and experiments remain the ultimate arbitrator of truth. And if it weren't for a Google search engine, my effectiveness as a researcher would be greatly diminished. China has no access to Google search. And so, I actually was giving a speech in China where I said, this is not good. <laughs> Open up Google search. Um, okay, so how can we respond to Chinese uh, theft? Uh, and so, let me give you a little bit of history that many of you may not know about. So on September 2015, uh, President Obama uh, met with Xi Jinping. And uh, there was increasing evidence that there was more industrial spying going on. Finally, the president says, look, we've got to stop this. And when I was Secretary of Energy, I, my four and a half years, four or third years, I said, this is, this is a new Cold War. We've got to damp it down. And so at a news conference in September 2015, they announced that both countries agreed not to use the tools of national cyber tools, which are considerable, much more powerful than private companies, uh, to uh, help companies engage in espion economic espionage. And the deal specifically didn't cover, it, it covers the theft of trade secrets, but not national security information. That was considered spy versus spy stuff, that's okay. <laughs> but companies, no, don't use the tools. Uh, so what happened? President Trump canceled the agreement when he became president, as he did the Paris Accord, as he did the Intermediate Continental Ballistic Missile Treaty, as he did the agreement with Iran, and miraculously, industrial espionage increased from China. All right, what can we do about it? First, let's acknowledge that there are real issues, and it's my, it's my view, and I've been talking about this publicly and also privately in the last uh, several months, that efforts to obtain information before researchers are ready to publish 
or posts is scientifically unethical, that faculty members who receive significant support, uh, support from institutions should declare it, uh, and they have to disclose connections. And any contractor asks a faculty member in the U.S. to not disclose the contract to their home institution uh, should be simply banned, as it is in the NIH. Uh, let's see what did I say. And there could be no conflict of commitment with uh, one's home institutions. And so I feel very strong it's the responsibility of the professors to teach scientific ethics to their students. From demanding full reproducibility of scientific results to publishing everything in the methods section that enables the competition to repeat their experiment, which is not always done. In Stanford, in the medical school, we give class, a required class on scientific ethics. All right, let me turn to the last thing, the need to build, rebuild trust across America. And retreating into our own little bubbles that we can so effectively do in the internet is not building trust, or building walls between countries don't build trust. So I'm gonna take you back to an episode of the West Wing. How many people have seen the West Wing? Uh, okay, good. So this is uh, about Robert Frost, who wrote this po poem called Mending Fences, and do good fences make good neighbors? I'm sure he quotes Robert Frost. Good fences make good neighbors. Did he talk about that? Yeah. What did he say? Basically that if you stay within your personal space, you'll end up getting along fine with everyone. You had to study modern poetry. Yes. Is that what Frost meant? No, he meant that boundaries are what alienate us from each other. Why did he say good fences make good neighbors? He was being ironic, but I still don't see <laughs> This was missed by some politicians. <laughs> uh, that Frost was being ironic. <laughs> that good fences don't make good neighbors. When you erect barriers, you don't interact with them, and you increase suspicion. Let me tell you another story, a uh, personal story. I was above this, in this committee rising above the gathering storm. We were trying to sell it to the President of the United States, George Bush. I uh, had a good friend, Condi Rice. She agreed to see me. I brought along Chuck Vest, uh, the former president of MIT, and Ralph Cicerone. So we met with her an hour, explained to her how important the program was. I met with another good friend who was then Secretary of Energy, Sam Bodman. I spent an hour with him talking about how important it was. But we couldn't, we couldn't make any headway with the big cheese. So I called up someone on the committee named Peter O'Donnell. And I said, Peter, because at the end of this work, he says, Steve, I like you. If you ever need a favor, just call me up. All right, late November, I called Peter. He says, Peter, this is Steve. Uh, you're a good friend of the president. We got to get in front of the president of the United States. So he says, well, Steve, I know about the education part. What about the rest? He says, Peter, it's all good. A little pause. Okay, Steve, I trust you. But before I bring it to the president, I got it before Don Evans, who was then Secretary of Commerce, very close personal friend of the president. And because he's just going to turn around the president and say, well, boss, what do you think? And I said, Peter, that's exactly what Secretary Bauman told me. He says, Steve, I know that. <laughs> So, months go by, it becomes part of the State of the Union address of President Bush. It becomes part of his budget to do the things we were suggesting in Rising Above the Gathering Storm. A month later, I'm in the uh, Department of Energy, the Deputy Secretary says, Steve, we owe you a great favor. We were pulling the same direction that then Secretary of Energy uh, and the Department and I was. And he said, well, what do I do? He said, you don't know what happened? He said, no. The president has a private dinner uh, with Don Evans and the First Lady. He gets called away for the next 45 minutes. Don Evans bent the First Lady's ear. How great the report was. Who knows how long it took the First Lady to bend the president's ear, how great the report is. And it makes the State of the Union in the budget. It was all personal trust and contact, okay? And now I'm gonna end by saying, but that's just a little story. This is a very, and I, Apologize for the movie, it's a bit long, and I'm gonna end on this, but it's Mr. Rogers on Building Trust. 
let me set the stage. He's going before a congressional committee, uh, the U.S. Senate Commerce Committee, uh, to request to support uh, national public television. The chair of the committee was not disposed to doing it. He's going to put up with the hearing, and then he's going to say no. And so, uh, and Mr. Rogers wasn't appreciated the way he is today. He was also partially under attack for being a little too lenient with young people. You know, totally, you know, give them love and acceptance was a little, you know, you need a little bit of uh, tough love as well. So, that's the stage. It's ever happened to public television, and his Peabody Award is testament to that fact. We in public television are proud of Fred Rogers, and I'm proud to present Mr. Rogers to you now. All right, Rogers, you got the floor. <laughs> Senator Pastore, this is a philosophical statement and would take about 10 minutes to read, so I'll not do that. Uh, one of the first things that a child learns in a healthy family is trust. And I trust what you have said that you will read this. It's very important to me. I care deeply about children. My first children. Will it make you happy if you read it? I'd just like to talk about it, if it's all right. My first children's program <clears throat> was on WQED 15 years ago, and its budget was $30. Now, with the help of the Sears Robot Foundation and the National Educational Television, as well as all of the affiliated stations, each station pays to show our program. It's a unique kind of funding in educational television. With this help, now our program has a budget of $6,000. It may sound like quite a difference, but $6,000 pays for less than two minutes of cartoons, two minutes of animated what I sometimes say, bombardment. I'm very much concerned, as I know you are, about what's being delivered to our children in this country. He's talking and about I've violence worked in the cartoons. field of child development for six years now, trying to understand the inner needs of children. We deal with such things as, as the inner drama of childhood. We don't have to bop somebody over the head to make him, to, to make drama on the screen. We deal with such things as getting a haircut or the feelings about brothers and sisters and the kind of anger that arises in simple family situations. And we speak to it constructively. How long a program is it? It's a half hour every day. Most channels schedule it in the, in the noontime as well as in the evening. Uh, WETA here has scheduled it in the late afternoon. Could we get a copy of this so that we can see it? Maybe not today, but I'd like to see the program. I'd like very much for I'd you to like see I'd like to see the program itself, or any one of them, you see. We, we made 100 programs for EEN, the Eastern Educational Network, and then when the money ran out, people in Boston and Pittsburgh and Chicago all came to the fore and said, we've got to have more of this neighborhood expression of care. And this is what, this is what I give. I give an expression of care every day to each child to help him realize that he is unique. I end the program by saying, you've made this day a special day by just your being you. There's no person in the whole world like you, and I like you just the way you are. And I feel that if we in public television can only make it clear that feelings are mentionable and manageable, we will have done a great service for mental health. Uh, I think that it's much more dramatic that two men could be working out their feelings of anger, much more dramatic than showing something of gunfire. 
I'm constantly concerned about what our children are seeing. And for 15 years, I have tried in this country and Canada to present what I feel is a meaningful expression of care. Do you narrate it? I'm the host, yes. And I do all the puppets, and I write all the music, and I write all the scripts. Well, I'm supposed to be a pretty tough guy, and this is the first time I've had goosebumps for the last two days. Well, I'm grateful, not only for your goosebumps, but for your interest in, in our kind of communication. Could I tell you the words of one of the songs which I feel is very important? Yes. This has to do with that good feeling of control, which I feel that the children need to know is there. And it starts out, what do you do with the mad that you feel? And that first line came straight from a child. I work with children do, doing puppets in, in very personal communication with small groups. What do you do with the mad that you feel? When you feel so mad, you could bite. When the whole wide world seems oh so wrong, and nothing you do seems very right. What do you do? Do you punch a bag? Do you pound some clay or some dough? Do you round up friends for a game of tag or see how fast you go? It's great to be able to stop when you've planned a thing that's wrong and be able to do something else instead and think this song. I can stop when I want to, can stop when I wish, can stop, 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 any time. And what a good feeling to feel like this and know that the feeling is really mine. Know that there's something deep inside that helps us become what we can. For a girl can be someday a lady and a boy can be someday a man. I think it's wonderful. I think it's wonderful. Looks like you just earned the twenty million dollars. <laughs> <laughs>okay let me let me just end by saying I uh, um, when I was Secretary of Energy I had many quiet conversations with members of Congress both sides nothing ever became public of those conversations uh, because if it ever does you break the trust I think the triple AS can try to help mend the fences not mend the fences and erect walls but mend the bridges between the Republicans and the Democrats that you meet with small groups from both parties at the same time, one or two, three. And we need to do this in order to rebuild the trust uh, because there are good people on both sides of the aisle. And so I will end by just saying that that is one of the visions and in my remaining year as Triple S, I pledge to do uh, with the new CEO of SUDIP. And so this is very important for me also. Thank you for listening. Thank <clears throat> you.